Although traditional pharmacokinetic principles are also applicable for peptides and proteins, their in vivo disposition is to a large degree affected by their physiological function. Peptides, for example, which frequently have hormone activity, usually have short elimination half-lives, which is desirable for a close regulation of their endogenous levels and thus function. Contrary to that, transport proteins like albumin or antibodies have elimination half-lives of several days, which enables and ensures the continuous maintenance of necessary concentrations in the bloodstream. The largest obstacle for a successful pharmacotherapy with peptide and protein drugs is their delivery to the desired site of action. A clinically usable absorption of exogenously applied peptides and protein after oral application with conventional dosage forms is usually not present. This lack of systemic bioavailability is mainly caused by two factors, high gastrointestinal enzyme activity and the function of the gastrointestinal mucosa as absorption barrier. There is substantial peptidase and protease activity in the gastrointestinal tract, making it to the most efficient body compartment for peptide and protein metabolism. Furthermore, the gastrointestinal mucosa presents a major absorption barrier for water-soluble macromolecules like peptides and protein. The lack of activity after oral administration for most peptides and proteins resulted in the preferred parenteral application into the utilization of non-oral administration pathways, for example, nasal, buccal, rectal, vaginal, percutaneous, ocular, or pulmonary drug delivery. Drug delivery via these administration routes, however, is also frequently accompanied by presystemic degradation processes. Bioavailability of numerous peptides and proteins is markedly reduced after subcutaneous or intramuscular administration compared to their intravenous administration. Whole body distribution studies are essential for classical small molecule drugs in order to exclude tissue accumulation of potentially toxic metabolites. This problem does not exist for protein drugs in which catabolic degradation products are amino acids recycled in the endogenous amino acid pool. Therefore, biodistribution studies for peptides and proteins are primarily performed to assess targeting to specific tissues as well as to identify the major elimination organs. The volume of distribution of proteins is usually small and limited to the volume of the extracellular space because of their high molecular weight and the related limited mobility because of impaired passage through biomembranes. After intravenous application, peptides and proteins usually follow a bi-exponential plasma concentration, time profile that can best be described by a two-compartment pharmacokinetic mode. Peptide and protein drugs are nearly exclusively metabolized via the same catabolic pathways as endogenous or dietetic proteins, leading to amino acids that are reutilized in the endogenous amino acid pool for the de novo biosynthesis of structural or functional body proteins. The elimination of peptides and proteins can occur unspecifically nearly everywhere in the body or can be limited to a specific organ or tissue. Locations of intensive peptide and protein metabolism are liver, kidneys, gastrointestinal tissue, and also blood and other body tissues. Molecular weight determines the major metabolism site as well as the predominant degradation process. The metabolism rate generally increases with decreasing molecular weight from large to small proteins to peptides, but is also dependent on other factors like secondary and tertiary structure as well as glycosylation. The clearance of a peptide or protein describes the irreversible removal of active substance from the extracellular space, which also includes cellular uptake besides metabolism. Because of the unspecific degradation of numerous peptides and proteins in blood, clearance can exceed cardiac output, that is, more than 5 liter per minute for blood clearance and more than 3 liter per minute for plasma clearance. Investigations on the detailed metabolism of peptides and proteins are relatively difficult because of the myriad of molecule fragments that may be formed. Proteolytic enzymes such as proteases and peptidases are ubiquitously available throughout the body, but are especially localized in blood, in the vascular endothelium, and also on cell membranes and within cells. Thus, intracellular uptake is per se more an elimination rather than a distribution process. While peptidases and proteases in the gastrointestinal tract and in lysosomes are relatively unspecific, 
soluble peptidases in the interstitial space and exopeptidases on the cell surface have a higher selectivity and determine the specific metabolism pattern of an organ. The proteolytic activity of subcutaneous tissue, for example, results in a partial loss of activity of subcutaneously compared to intravenously administrated interferon gamma. For orally administered peptides and proteins, the gastrointestinal tract is the major site of metabolism. Presystemic metabolism is the primary reason for their lack of oral bioavailability. Parenterally administered peptides and proteins, however, may also be metabolized in the intestinal mucosa following intestinal secretion. At least 20% of the degradation of endogenous albumin takes place in the gastrointestinal tract. For parenterally administered and endogenous peptides and proteins, the kidneys are the major elimination organ if they are smaller than the glomerular filtration limit of approximately 60 kilodalton, although the effective molecule radius is probably the limiting factor. Various renal processes are contributing to the elimination of peptides and proteins. For most substances, glomerular filtration is the dominant, rate-limiting step as subsequent degradation processes are not saturable under physiologic conditions. Hence, the renal contribution to the overall elimination of peptides and proteins is reduced if the metabolic activity for these proteins is high in other body regions and it becomes negligible in the presence of unspecific degradation throughout the body. In contrast to that, the contribution to total clearance approaches 100% if the metabolic activity is low in other tissues or if distribution is limited. After glomerular filtration, small linear peptides undergo intraluminal metabolism, predominantly by exopeptidases in the luminal brush border membrane of the proximal tubules. The resulting amino acids are transcellularly transported back into the systemic circulation. Larger peptides and proteins are actively reabsorbed in the proximal tubules via endocytosis. This cellular uptake is followed by addition of lysosomes and hydrolysis to peptide fragments and amino acids, which are returned to the systemic circulation. Therefore, only minuscule amounts of intact protein are detectable in urine. An additional renal elimination mechanism is peritubular extraction from post-glomerular capillaries with subsequent intracellular metabolism, which has, for example, been described for vasopressin and calcitonin. Apart from proteolysis and the kidneys, the liver substantially contributes to the metabolism of peptide and protein drugs. Proteolysis usually starts with endopeptidases that attack in the middle part of the protein, and the resulting oligopeptides are then further degraded by exopeptidases. The ultimate metabolites of proteins, amino acids, and dipeptides are finally reutilized in the endogenous amino acid pool. The rate of hepatic metabolism is largely dependent on specific amino acid sequences in the protein. An important first step in the hepatic metabolism of proteins and peptides is the uptake into hepatocytes. Small peptides may cross the hepatocyte membrane via passive diffusion if they have sufficient hydrophobicity. Uptake of larger peptides and proteins is facilitated via various carrier-mediated, energy-dependent transport processes. Receptor-mediated endocytosis is an additional mechanism for uptake into hepatocytes. Receptor binding is usually negligible compared to total amount of drug in the body for conventional small molecule drugs and rarely affects their pharmacokinetic profile. In contrast to that, a substantial fraction of a peptide and protein dose can be bound to receptors. This binding can lead to elimination through receptor-mediated uptake and subsequent intracellular metabolism. The endocytosis process is not limited to hepatocytes, but can occur in other cells as well, including the therapeutic target cells. Since the number of receptors is limited, their binding and the related drug uptake can usually be saturated within therapeutic concentrations. Thus, receptor-mediated elimination constitutes a major source for nonlinear pharmacokinetic behavior of numerous peptide and protein drugs, that is, a lack of dose proportionality. Because of the antigenic potential of proteins, formation of antibodies is a frequently observed phenomenon during chronic therapy with protein drugs, especially if human proteins are used in animal studies or if animal-derived proteins are applied in human clinical studies. Most monoclonal antibodies are murine in nature 
and their systemic administration can lead to the development of human antimouse immunoglobulin antibody or HAMA response, which is in most cases directed against the constant regions of the immunoglobulin. Genetically engineered mouse human chimeric antibodies try to minimize this immunogenicity in man by joining variable domains of the mouse to the constant regions of human immunoglobulins. Extravascular injection is known to stimulate antibody formation more than intravenous application, most likely due to the increased immunogenicity of protein aggregates and precipitates formed at the injection site. The presence of antibodies can obliterate the biological activity of a protein drug. In addition, protein antibody complexation can also modify the distribution, metabolism, and excretion, that is, the pharmacokinetic profile, of the protein drug. Elimination can either be increased or decreased. Faster elimination of the complex occurs if the reticuloendothelial system is stimulated. Elimination is slowed down if the antibody drug complex forms a depot for the protein drug. This effect would prolong the drug's therapeutic activity that might be beneficial if the complex formation does not decrease therapeutic activity. Furthermore, antibody binding may also interfere with bioanalytical methods like immunoassays. In summary, significant progress has been made in understanding pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, as well as toxicity profiles of therapeutic proteins in animals and humans, which have been in commercial development for more than three decades. However, in the pharmacokinetics arena, many fundamental questions remain to be resolved. Investigative and bioanalytical tools need to be established to improve the translation of pharmacokinetics data from animals to humans and from in vitro assays to in vivo readouts, which would ultimately lead to a higher success rate in drug development. In toxicology, it is known, in general, what studies are needed to safely develop therapeutic proteins. One of the major complicating factors in non-clinical and clinical programs for therapeutic proteins is the impact of immunogenicity. Despite the issues, a large number of biotherapeutics have been successfully brought to market with acceptable benefit-to-risk ratios, providing better treatments to innumerable patients.